Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the all-in-one cloud-based e-learning authoring tool for teams. You can learn more at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Well, hello. Hello. Happy Northern Time Zone Day. <laughs> yes. Um, it's the day that we all put our clocks one hour north uh, here in Canada. It's got something and, to do with a, an animal of some sort, right? Well, the, 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 res, the result of it is it, it's synchronized with Groundhog Day. And, and the truth is, because of this Northern Time Zone difference, and being a day ahead, um, it really actually means that we can see the future before anybody else. Back to the future. Yeah. Nice. I mean, you've heard of the international date line, uh, you know, where you suddenly you're, you're yesterday or the day before or, or the next day or, or whatever. It's, it's kind of the same thing, um, but it's, it's the northern time zone, as we call it. Otherwise known as the international Canadian tomorrow line. There we go. International Canadian Tomorrow. The ICTL goes into effect this evening. Don't forget to set your clocks one hour north. <laughs> I know there's somebody uh, in the chat that's very confused right now. Yeah, they're like, what is wrong with and, these people? Yeah, I know. Ah, look, guys, Good you'll morning. figure it out. Just, just Google it, everybody. You'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Hey, gang. Kevin Thorne's back with us, and we have a, a drink and draw. Now, I know I say this every time, but believe it or not, Kevin, there may still actually be people joining us today who have not encountered you, either in a previous idiotic episode or in one of the many other places where you uh, where you show up in our e-learning and learning design world. So go ahead and introduce yourself to the gang. Hi, gang. Kevin Thorne. Um, been around, as uh, Chris has mentioned, quite a few years. Uh, Started my first career in the U.S. Army, retired. Um, after that, I went back to school, got my undergrad in information technology, and started my um, IT career with uh, lots of enthusiasm. Um, probably put about a year or two with that fresh degree until I was introduced to the training department. Um, so I went over to the training department with my fresh IT degree, <laughs> and didn't know anything about training. Um, it was the first time I heard the word LMS and some other terminology. But anyway, it was the, uh, the quest to create an online university for a corporate. And um, so I just basically took myself to school, used that corporate life to learn everything I could about the tools, technologies. Um, about a decade later, Brent entered my life and flipped it <laughs> upside down by inviting me to a... Uh, conference that wait, i had never heard of wait, wait wait a minute did he invite you to move in with him in uh in, in, in beverly hills no uh, if anyway. no, no uh yeah so it was when brent's back in the days when he was uh, working for the e-learning guild and he invited me to a conference so i showed up and that was my first conference presentation that spring uh that fall i went to devlearn um experienced that for the first time and that's where i won my first demo fest award um, and the freelancing just sort of took off from there. Um, a couple of years later, uh, let's see, we were one, two, third career. Um, I quit my job in 2012, oh, 10 years ago, coming up, uh, hmm. 10 years ago and started Nuggethead Studios. And now I'm just a, uh, I, I refer to it as a boutique sort of custom e-learning design and development creative studio uh, it's more i do more than just instruction design and e-learning i'm an illustrator i do sketch notes uh i draw cartoons and make comics um, i'm a certified lego serious play facilitator so we use lego in a lot of different so i just i play and draw all day 
<laughs> not a bad life. You know, you're making this um, this whole freelancing thing sound awfully darn good. Um, it's, it has its moments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is, I guess, what we're kind of talking about really today, maybe, is a bit more of some of the things you need to make sure that you can actually have. If you are doing that kind of a freelancer or e-learning consulting kind of career, the things that we need to you need to be aware of and think about so that you can have that lifestyle of the rich and famous, or uh, at least of, of, the, of the lifestyle of Kevin Thorne. The content and comfortable, I would call there it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't come without a price. I think that's the important part that we need to talk about today too, right? There is, uh, everybody has fantasies about the freelancing life, the, con the consulting life, the starting your own small business, um, you know, life. And, you know, it's wonderful to have all that, uh, you know, uh, what do I want to say control or, you know, you have your own authority, but with that power comes great responsibility. Right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I know this is a, a drink and draw <clears throat> and we were trying to, we were just discussing before we came live on how are we going to draw and have this conversation. And then we were thinking about, um, I've got Miro set up a board that we can do kind of create a board. I'm almost thinking, um, I don't, I, we don't have that much time, but I know you all have a lot of questions. So, Brent, you said there was something you had three questions you wanted to shoot, and then we could just kind of start there and start feeling some answers as Brent could disconnects. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, so Brent did set up a poll. So if you're just getting in or uh, what have you, if you're you know joining us here, just take a second and, and drop in your vote um, in the poll question. Just That'll give us a sense of the audience who's joining us today. Uh, so yeah. Brent said, uh, set up this poll. How would you describe your current status? That you are a freelancer or you are a consultant um, or a full-time employee uh, of an organization and a freelance on the side, um, or you're on the verge of sort of moving from that into being full-time freelancer, or are you just a full-time employee uh, for life and uh, probably never going to freelance? But uh, let's take a second. I feel like yeah, I'm looking sort at of poll question theme music or something that that somebody should be humming right now but let's get some info in there and we'll see what to, what the world tells us there yeah i'm just looking at joe's comment about she's and i know joe she's in the in the industry for a while freelance consultant running her own business watching this while working with a backache but i booked next friday so uh wow. that's interesting that's that's an area that i fail miserably Mm -hmm. uh, booking my own time off. Yeah, and it's got to be hard. I mean, those of us who who uh, you know work in an organization or whatever, you know, you, you think about the calendar differently, obviously, than than if you are um, if you're just trying to constantly juggle, you know, the way that a freelancer or a consultant needs to juggle. So, yeah. Um, Leanne has a great question. Um, I've been a freelance. I've been a freelance, but consultant sounds like a higher level of work. <laughs> um, if I were to leave my very comfortable corporate job, I don't know where whether I would be better at freelance development or a full-on learning consultant. Can you discuss the difference? Yes. One, Leanne, I left a very comfortable, cushy corporate job with a nice salary and bonus. Um, walked away uh, to do this. Now. I started out as an e-learning developer, e-learning designer. The consultant part of it sort of evolved because consulting is, when, when somebody hires you as a consultant, it's because they don't have the knowledge or the experience to do that themselves. They need help and you're, you're bringing help. Whether you do the actual work or not is, is a question of the contract and an agreement, but a consultant is just like an advisor. So if you start there with, hey, I need help, great. You know, I'll charge you an hour of my time and share with me what I would recommend or what I would do. So that in itself at a fundamental level is what a consultant is. Um, I've taken on contracts where it's both. I'm coming in as a consultant to kind of steer the direction or help them develop a strategy and then take the lead on that strategy and actually do the design and development of a project. Um, that's a double whammy, um, kind of like a rare bird. You don't you don't get those projects very often. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, 
I hope that explains the difference, Leanne. And that you're gonna have to keep up with the chat for me there, Brent, because I'm yeah. Like, I think yep. Bobby makes Bobby makes a good point uh, in clarifying too. She says I feel like freelance is doing the work, and consulting provides a more strategic edge. Yeah, consulting is more the advising side, recommendations. Um, you're teaching, advising, yeah. recommending, I don't things think like that. I think it specifically means that you don't do. The no, work. right. I think right, at right. times when you're a consultant, yeah. maybe you do do some of the actual work to yeah. get the job done or whatever but the most times the consultants will hire freelancers who then do the work or yeah or yeah, right. exactly right because i remember when i first started hearing the word consult when i was working in corporate this person would come in they'd walk around analyze make a bunch of notes write up a re big report corporate would pay them you know dozens of dollars and they'd leave and they've got a they all they did they, they left a report behind so in my mind that's what a, a consultant was and then i quickly learned that's not what it is. <laughs> um, so yeah, it just it just depends on what they're. I, I've never considered myself a consultant more as an independent contractor. I, I, I and, and and this is just my buzzwords, I guess. Mm -hmm. When I hear the word freelance, I hear in my mind it's you're moonlighting and you're part time. But I hear the term full time freelancer. But if you're a full-time freelancer, are you not then an independent contractor for hire? So it's mm -hmm. just semantics, I guess. Yeah, yeah uh, it is all it is all just the words, right? What are so what are some of those things? Somebody mentioned taxes. I saw in the chat. So let's yeah let's jump you, right into some just, of the meat of this, right? Like what are what are the like, three big things? Let's start with that. Just keep it simple that people should be considering that maybe they're not considering when they jump into doing being either one freelance consultant, whatever. All right. So um, if you're considering, you have to make a decision. Are you going to be, are you going to do a part-time? You're going to do a full-time. You're going to keep your day job and I'm going to do this part-time. Um, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to go full-time. And that's the scary part because we have that sense of security with a full-time job and those sorts of things, right? right. Um, the first and foremost, if, you, if you're on that track, separate your personal income from this side business, business income, Se completely separate them. And then where the money is coming in, let's say your freelance business, let's, uh, in my, my world, it's full-time. So I pay myself, I pay the personal bank account a monthly salary and then that salary then is used to to live on um, and then that budget because one thing with with this type of work it's a peak and valley so you might make half of what you expected this month and you might make three times what you expected next month but if you spend three times what you make next month and you're like i'm living the great life then when you get into another valley you're going to be stuck so you got to find it takes time to figure that that balance plane, that middle line, and then you budget and live on that line because there's going to be valleys. There's going to be really dry periods and there's going to be really great periods. So you got to prepare yourself that you can keep that steady income. And then over you, you do that for a year or two to find your average and then whether or not you deserve to promote yourself or give yourself a raise. You know, it's like, well, I'm going to add another. $500 a month to my monthly salary because my work is steadily incoming. You know, the, the revenue is in, in, increasing. Um, so that's, that's one of the big things to separate that. And um, I started part-time. Nobody just quits their job and starts full-time and replaces their salary. income. Nobody does that. No matter what you're hearing, oh, you can make $100,000 a year. No, you can't right out the gate. You can't do that. And if you do do that, that's because you've got two decades of experience and you can walk right into a great consulting job. So if you're just trying to figure this out and start out, do the freelance, but you, you study the business acumen side, study the tax side, the, the accounting side, the legal side. Get all of those very necessary, fundamental, boring, dry topics out of the way. And then as you create your income on that side bank account, what I did is I waited and your, your situation might be different, but um, I wanted six months of my 
day jobs, like what, what it takes to live my family's lifestyle, if you will, right? Mortgages, food, gas, all that kind of food, clothing, shelter. I wanted six months of that in my business account before I quit the day job. Mm -hmm. Because I knew that if I didn't get a single contract, I'd be okay for six months. Which the idea is you, you didn't, you're not taking a six month sabbatical. You're actually going to go do some work. Um, but if things didn't look good after the first 90 days, I still had 90 days to rethink and say, okay, maybe I need to go apply this, this full time, you know, independent things not working out. And then after that, you just budget and always make sure you're at least three months ahead always because of those dry periods. Um, and then once you get to that point, then you're, then you're financially secure enough to say, okay, now what are some other things that I need to think about before I quit my day job? Money is not an issue now because I've secured that. And it might take you two years. It might take you three years, right? So don't, you know, that's the plan. You have to strategize your own strategy. You're going to be a consultant, consult with yourself and think through how you would do this, plan it, put a plan together, you know? So how about, should we, should we throw that onto the board? Um, so we get that this kind of tracked. Um, oh and gosh! After yeah. the session, and, and be, everybody's going to ask. And after the session, we'll we'll throw this into the. Um, well, no, well, no, Kevin, you 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 you, um, you can't type and talk at the same time. Anyway, you know what? So. I tell you what. Let's do this. Just, let's. It, can you capture the chat after we get done? Can you can you export? The yeah, chat? we can we can export it. Yeah. 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 Let's do that. Okay. Cool. I mean, so what you what you've described there, Kevin, is being echoed by a couple of folks in the chat. Lisa's saying, "I didn't make money in my business for the first four months, and I came with a lot of experience." Um, Robert was suggesting, "I've always heard that you should have a minimum one year expenses saved prior to starting full time consulting." Um, and Dana threw in a note just now: um, the six to twelve month cushion will also avoid the need to take on every single project that comes your way. Um, you know, either burnout or or even just balancing. Yeah things so yeah yeah learning to say no is a hard thing to do learning to say mm -hmm. now going back to the expenses yeah. thing um expenses is different than your full living lifestyle right so what are what are expenses versus if if you needed that entire full-time income in contractor income to live your life that's your kids school supplies it's you know buying windshield wipers when it's a rainy day i mean that's everything right your entire budget um, one year expenses. I don't look at it as one year expenses so much. And it's different. However, people, I look at it as there's also an emergency fund, like a cash, cash reserves that's put away and you figure out what that is in your, cause you know, the washing machine breaks, you got to go buy a new washer. You know, you, you, you blow out a tire, you got to go buy a new set of tires, things like that's emergency, right? Cash, right? You don't want to, you don't want to be stuck with those kind of things, but mm -hmm. that's, that has nothing to do with, being a contractor that just has to do with planning your budget yeah i think one of the things that you and i talked about that um kind of sparked this idea to talk about this um is having money for the stuff that we all like to get right the gear the software the you know i need a new camera because i'm a a webcam. I'm an I'm an I'm a trainer, but now everything's online. But I can't afford one, or I need some authoring software. I can't afford, you know, to pay for it. I, you know, all that kind of stuff. Or I need a new computer, right? Like every few years, you kind of want to upgrade. And I think we forget about that. That there should be a line item in your budget where you're putting money aside consistently, because sooner or later, your hardware is gonna it's going to crap out and you're yeah. going to, no, in order will. to keep the business matter of when. Yeah. It's not a matter of if it's a matter of when. Sure. Yep. Um, real quick. I want to answer Leanne's question is like, what should a consultant be able to do? Uh, good. That's a great question. Um, I answered this question last night as well. Um, what are you good at? Um, think about, think about the different people in your life, friends, family, neighbors, whoever that come to you and ask for your advice. Or what about the people in your current workplace that come to you because you're like the known internal expert on these particular subjects? What are you really good at? I promise you there's thousands of people that need your help on that particular subject. So I go back to a piece of advice my dad gave me years ago. Figure out what you're good at. Find the gap where people need your help 
and then learn how to make money doing that. It's a simple manifesto, yeah. if you will, right? It's all it is. I, I'm but, not. I'm not exactly sure, but I, I think Leanne might be referring to kind of the difference between it being a consultant and being a freelancer, right? Like, like freelance would be uh, somebody needs a course created in a very specific authoring uh, tool, whatever you create it, it's got an end thing. But as a consultant, right? If you're a strategic thinker or whatever, you go into a business, they pay you to help them think about stuff. Like then what do you, you know, I kind of but, have an answer cause I have had to figure this out over the years, but you, what do I you would, think? um, personally, uh, I think it's semantics that we put too much salt in the labels of what a consultant, freelance contractor, all it is. Um, Cause I can be, uh, an, I can be a, a consultant, how to properly inflate your tires. Right. I mean, it, uh, I can be an auto mechanic consultant. I can be an e-learning <laughs> development consultant. All, the, all a consultant is, is you're, you're sharing or you're getting paid for your experience, advice, and knowledge. Whatever that gap that you're trying to fill, that would be a consultant. Now, whether or not you're the e-learning developer Yes, I'm a freelance consultant, so I can throw those words together and still, I think it's semantics, right? I don't know that there's a difference. If you're truly 100% a consultant, then that's all you do is you, you go in, you analyze, you, you, you offer some advice, you write up a big report on a recommendation, you walk out, you get paid. You don't do any hands-on work at all. If that's true, quote to quote, a consultant, I imagine that's what a consultant is. I think it's all semantics. In a lot of words. I don't know. Maybe mm -hmm. I'm wrong. I don't put a lot of thought into it. Yeah, I'm, I'm the chief. Nugget. I'm the chief nugget head. That's all I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just. I'm just the nugget. <laughs> uh, going back to your question on the hardware and software and all that kind of stuff. Uh, believe it or not, um, Mission Turfgrass uh, that that I built for that award, Brent, was completely developed on a used, borrow, borrowed, used, um, and then I later purchased. Um, $600 laptop. And uh, I think I got the external monitor from uh, like the thrift store. I don't know. I paid 50 bucks for it to plug it in. And that was, that was how I started. Um, and then the <clears throat> same thing with your budget. When you talk about where to get all this fancy gear and stuff like that, I literally have a hardware budget line item, a software budget line item, a Lego line item. <laughs> an art store line item yeah, and yeah. then what i and then what i do is every month i put a certain amount of and then i've got these different accounts in my bank so i have a hardware software account and that account split into two hardware software that's the annual recurring licenses on softwares hardware sometimes i don't need hardware but it keeps building up so i'll add you know ten dollars a month to this line item or 25 dollars a month to that line item because um, I'm not going to need a computer every year, but I'm going to need a computer every five, six years, something like that. Well, $20 a month over a period of time, at least I'm not having to, you know, I might have to borrow a little bit, um, but I can save up a couple thousand dollars over a couple of years. So when that time comes, like, oh, my monitor just crashed. Okay, well, 600 bucks, we go got to get another monitor. That way you don't have to think about it, right? Yeah. Um, and it's not stressing out. You're not putting, you know, you're not charging things on credit cards and things like that. But it, it's all about that fundamental budgeting and planning and line. And then whatever, like an annual subscription on something is, divide that by 12. And then that's how much you contribute to that line item every month. So by the end of that year or the end of that 12 months, you have the amount to pay for that subscription or license or whatever. And then I would I would say just to kind of wrap up Leanne's question, she's um, uh, from that consulting perspective and trying to understand you have all the bases covered. You know, if if an organization is going to be paying you 50 grand to come in and put their strategy together at the very end of something like that, you're going to need to be giving them a document of some sort that yeah. that lays out everything so you do have a deliverable at the end of it and you, sure you and, do. Yeah. and it always depends on what they want what they're asking you to do if they're asking you to do like everything to be like to build their strategic plan for the future 
you know, you need an executive summary. You need the details. You know, you should hire this number of extra people. These are the types of jobs you should have on your team, right? Every consultant that I've ever met in this industry over the years has had a different sort of shtick mm. that makes shtick. them who they are, <laughs> right. right? And and what they offer a company and, um, you know, some specialize on strategically picking learning management systems, right? Uh, only, but then others are really good at putting together that whole picture and helping people build out their team, you know? And then others are just here, let's, here's the strategy for how you should build all of your training. Whether or not you should buy off the shelf or build, help solve those problems and whatnot. But yeah. it's all your expertise, figuring it's out what gap. that customer mm -hmm. needs, right? And fill in the gaps. And then have a document at the end that says, after all this money that you paid me to think for you and use all of my years of experience and my network and everything... This is a exceptionally valuable strategic document that will guide you in your next five years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a couple of questions. We'll, we'll just pop to the question panel here quickly. So yeah. uh, Craig was Craig's post, tossed in, uh, you know, from, from, from you, he's asking, was there a catalyst in making the decision to jump out of corporate? You know, was it a long term or was it an immediate event? It's, it sounds like you intended this and you planned it out. Um, no, at, no, I didn't. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, I I was freelancing um, because I was curious. I was trying to satisfy a curiosity that I wasn't getting from corporate. Um, if you remember, it was right around that 2010, 28 kind of period when I started the part timing because the iPhone had just come out in 07, smartphones, the iPad released in 2010. And I was just, my mind was exploding. You know, there's, there's so many cool things we can do. And I was, um, uh, you know, I would kind of get, you know, you're kind of, you're, 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 you're speaking, you know, lost in space there, Kevin. Cause I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if we put armbands and the smartphone on our forearm and then we can kind of look up things and help <laughs> our customers right on the floor. Why do you no, you, how are you going to do that? This and that. I said, yeah, but wouldn't that be cool? Right. Or, uh, we had, you know, outside sales people. I said, what if we took, you know, all of the stuff that they need, this three ring binder that they carry around with them. What if we put that on an iPad and then they can just keep that in their car with them when they're driving around and then they, you know, they can go right into the customer and right into the office with them. It's like, you know what it would take to do that? I don't know, but let's figure it out. And um, I would get some ideas pitched and they would agree to it. It's like, well, how much would that cost? Because as we all know, training is a cost center, not a revenue, right? So if I'm going to spend $50,000 on new hardware and a time to make something, how am I going to get that money back for the company? In our company, minimum 15% ROI, or we're not even going to talk about it. So I had to prove a 15% ROI just to pitch it. Then it goes to a committee. Then it says, oh, yeah, that's great. But, hey, we've already passed the fiscal year, so we'll put you on for next fiscal year. Uh, your budget. So, you know, it's 18 months before you get the money to start. Well, by then, you know, version iPad 13.7 comes out, right? A year and a half later. Um, so it was just, it was just irritating. It was frustrating. Not that I didn't hate my job. I love the company. I love the work I was doing, uh, but it wasn't satisfying the need. So I started freelancing uh, and by mistake or luck or stars aligned or whatever, a year or so later, freelancing was another full-time job. Hmm. And I was working, you know, I would work the day job, come home, have dinner, turn around, go back to work um, another six to eight hours at night, every night, three, four hours a night. Uh, weekends were gone. Um, and one had to go. I just, it was not sustainable. Hmm. So I had, the, that, that's when I decided, okay, th this might, there might be some, there might be a future in this full-time thing. But it wasn't. I didn't start out with an intention to go full time. Cool. Um, and and Buddy is asking, um, yeah, how do you get clients? <laughs> what if you've got the design and e-learning development skills, but you don't yet have a reputation um, in the industry? How do you bring in clients or start getting clients? Which I guess a, even the bigger picture, how do you keep getting clients over time? Um, over time, it tends up it yeah. ends up being referrals and return mm -hmm. clients. You know, over time, I get a lot of that. Um, um, and this was another question that was asked to me last night. One, you need a portfolio. Um, 
you know, you got to, you, you need a digital business card. You need to be able to send somebody a link to something that shows them not, not a resume, but something that shows them on what you can do. If it's your writing skills, if it's your design skills, if it's your development skills, if it's your programming skills, whatever your skills are, put some kind of a portfolio and only be one or two air and one or two items in each of those areas, <clears throat> depending on, on what you want. Um, uh, that's the first start. And the second, probably the most importantly, because we are in the age of social media, um, learn how LinkedIn works, learn how hashtags and Twitter works, find your community, find your tribe, and then embed yourself in the conversation. If you, if you look at people that are in the industry and, and um, if you go to their profile, let's say on LinkedIn, and you say they liked a lot of stuff and they shared a lot of stuff, but they've not contributed to anything or they haven't started their own conversations. So you need to embed yourself in those conversations in the community in which you want to be part of. And then your name gets in those conversations. People start right. And then you, you have debates, you have challenges, you question, or you ask a question and you get feedback. And then when that happens, those algorithms, you know, it, they highlight that. And the more they highlight those conversations that LinkedIn does, your name gets in front of more eyes, more views. And if somebody sees that conversation, it's interest, they jump in, that tags it up. So it's learning how those algorithms work. Unfortunately, that's how we network today. That's how you build your PLN. Um, but it, it's not just about being around and liking and sharing. It's starting conversations and engaging in those conversations. That's how you get your name. You know, that's how you get recognized. Um, and a portfolio digital, some kind of a digital business card of sorts. Uh, that's a good place to start. Anyway. And winning Demo Fest doesn't hurt either. Well. That's yeah. on the portfolio, you know. Yeah. Well, that was 10 years ago, 11 years yeah. ago, 12 years ago. Yeah. It, somebody's asking about federal contract opportunities. And in, in my experience, jumping through the hoops of doing anything with the government is such a nightmare. It's always better to go through somebody else who already has those connections and contacts and those contracts and, and their business is already sort of embedded into the epic system that is the government. And I guess it depends on the countries. I'm just talking about the U.S. here, folks. I'm not sure exactly how Canada works and or the U.K. or anything like that. But I know here it, it's it, it costs a lot of money to get into the the government system. And if you want a government contract, you did you got a lot of hoops to jump through, and you're going to be spending a lot of time doing that. So it's best to partner with somebody else who's already gone through that. Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah, you're right. I was just looking at Leanne. Leanne, now, yes, I do remember. Um, um, Brandon Carson was a director at Home Depot, and I know Brandon from way back. He knew I was a storyline developer, um, and then he invited me to come to Home Depot to teach their team. And then out of that, I ended up getting a contract to help them work on a project. So that's a good example of that networking stuff right you know somebody who knows somebody that invites you to come in to do some work and then that leads to another project um, going back to what you say on the federal grant and the, yeah definitely if somebody's already got that federal template process figured out um, jump on their take their coattails and and get in there um, if you're doing it on your own yes it is an absolute extra job in itself get that contract because of what you have to go through and all the different things you have to uh, qualify and get registered for. But if you are um, small business, veteran owned, disability, minority, if you have any women owned business, if you have any of those classifications, go get yourself the, the qualifications to be federally recognized because you automatically go to the top of the list and Companies, when they're bidding against government contracts, have a priority. They have to give a, a, a number of percentage of those contracts to those businesses. So you you have if you have if you fall in any of those categories, it would it's it's a no brainer to get in that list. And then you don't you just sit. They either come find you or you can go look at the list. And go, oh, I like that. I'm going to go bid on that. Um, and then once you bid on it, you get the con. But you know as well as I don't know about Canada, but. The U.S. government has silly money when it comes to it. they just, and you know what? And this is I don't know we can, I know we're getting running out of time, but 
Um, at the last time I looked, I'm a, um, a veteran disability, I'm a U.S. disability veteran owned small business. Um, and because of that list or whatever, and then the minimum, no, if they consider me a small business, as long as I don't make $13 million a year or less. That's, that's what small enough. That's a small <laughs> business. And they consider a small contract, three million or less. I've never had those contracts, right? <laughs> never. But I'm thinking, but that's, I mean, that's just sign up and go bid for them and you, you never know, right? So it's. Yeah, it's I think crazy. another another part that we should point out with consulting and freelance and whatnot is that that's, that highlights a great point, And that is understanding money and thinking about money differently, right? Like uh, for a lot of us, a thousand bucks is a lot of money, right? You're going to go buy an iPad pro or whatever. Oh my gosh, a thousand bucks. Am I going to put it on a credit card? How am I going to pay it off? Uh, you know, but in the greater scheme of things, if you're going to be getting out and starting a business and if you're not comfortable talking to an executive or a potential client about hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars, Maybe you should dial it back and not think about consulting. Think more about freelancing and, you know, bite off yeah. a $10,000, $20,000 gig. And even that kind of freaks people out, right? So un thinking about money differently yeah. is probably one of the biggest, most conversations that I've had over the years in helping people level up their their freelance game. Here's my, here's my advice. Forget about the money. Do good work. Do quality work. Differentiate yourself with your quality work that you know that you're at least as good or better than anybody else in that sector. That's the attitude you need to have. You have that. You go out and get it. Money will follow. You'll get the contracts. It doesn't matter. But, to but you can't Brent's be point, shocked. You can't be shocked when someone walks up to you and says... How, how much do you think this is going to cost? 50 K to a hundred K. And you're like, no, I can just whip this out, you know, and just like, you know, 20 K will be fine. And then all of a sudden you find yourself a whole year into this project and you've only made 20 K. Well, when you're first thinking 20 K sounds like a lot of money, right? But if it took you a whole year to acquire that 20 K, that's below the poverty well, line. That's, so. Yeah, that's the value. <laughs> the value of what you place on yourself, it goes back to what you were saying a minute ago. Understand business acumen. That has nothing to do with the skills. It doesn't have anything to do with the industry that you're going in. Understanding business acumen is key. Right. Because you need to know how to speak business and talk business. Whether it's $10 or a million dollars, it's still the, 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 the speak, right? Right. You need to understand... Um, P and L statements, finance, revenue, sales, you know, um, before taxes, after taxes, understand how that works because businesses, that's how they speak. And they, when they're going to spend money, like Brent said, they're going to give you $50,000. What are they getting in return? How does it hit their bottom line? You know, it's got to fall within a fiscal year. What's their fiscal year? Does it fall in the fall? Does it fall at the calendar year? Understanding all of this is, is that's the knowledge you need to be in those conversations. And then budgeting your own side, right? Doing the budgeting side. So, you know, thousand dollars maybe a thousand dollars, but do you want to do you want to charge on a credit card or do you want to pay cash? When I bought when I first, when I bought my first Mac and it was going back to that borrowed laptop, <clears throat> I kept putting money back. Had the day job, wasn't even considering going full time, but I was tired of working on this laptop, <clears throat> and I wanted a Mac. I wanted to go over to the dark side. Um, so. Um, and my, a friend of mine who was had a, I don't know, it was one of those G Max at the time. I don't know, I can't remember the big tower. Mm -hmm. And I was really, I was like, oh man, I want that. I want that. And he says, yeah, but you, you don't need something like what I, I said, it doesn't matter. I just want it. It's just, <laughs> it's just what I want. So um, I made a, a thing. When I, when I get $5,000 in this bank account on this line item, I'm going to the Apple store. And then um, it's not because I was going to buy a $5,000 Mac. It's that I wanted to walk into the Apple store and be able to buy anything in that store that I wanted without worrying about, oh, I wish I could upgrade to this model. I can't afford that model. Um, and I went in to buy that GMAC, but my friendly Apple consultant, right, 
she's like, what do you do? Why do you want that? When do you need it? That kind of thing. And she talked me out of that and talked me into an iMac and saved me, I don't know, $2,500. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it was just, it was that feeling of that's the budgeting, right? It took a couple of years to get to that point. But budgeting, understanding P&L statements, understanding being a uh, business acumen, those are, it doesn't matter what line of work you go into. You, you really got to know that if you're going out on your own. Mm -hmm. um, and then three people that you need on your side, you need to hire a tax consultant or somebody to do help you with your tax because the tax code changes all the time, except in Canada. And then uh, that was a dad joke. It went right over his head. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I'm was. i focused on listening. No, so uh, you need a tax consultant. You need a lawyer, at least a contract lawyer, somebody to review contracts and um, look at operating agreements and things like that, that if you – if you have a question about a, 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 an agreement you're about to dive into, you need somebody to look at it and say, hey, you might want to change this paragraph or whatever. Um, and then, um, so tax consultant, and then an investment advisor. Um, and investment advisors are free, right? You give them money and they don't make money until you make money. Um, but you need, to, you need to make your money work for you because it's not going to work for itself. Like you want, you know, like, you know, money is not going to be their own boss. They just sit there and returns on regular savings account or, you know, I can sell lemonades out in my driveway and make more money that way. We've hit a lot of different topics here today um, on starting your own business. I hope everybody in the chat has um, figured out whether they want to do it or not. I noticed in the poll, we have mostly full-time employees some doing some freelancing on the side. Others are just here for the chat. <laughs> well, Dana uh, asked a really good question about retirement. That's a great one. Um, oh, yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> that's part of your budgeting, right? Um, yeah. I live uh, – one of the one of the things that – and I am very fortunate uh, to be married to my CFO uh, because she is a whiz at the financing and the budget. She used to be a financial analyst. Um but when we start, I say, like, woohoo, I made this month money. She says, no, you didn't. This has to go here. This has to go there. This has to go there. We got to put some of this back here. We go. I said, well, all that's left is 70% of what I just owned. I got 70 cents left, right? <laughs> you took like 30% of my money. I says, yeah, but that 30% is when you don't want to work anymore, right? So you have to, that's part of the budgeting, right? So there's um, self-employment tax. Uh, there's a thing called a SEP, which is like the equivalent of your own 401k plan that you invest. That's an investment advisor I was telling you about, right? So you set up your own independent 401k plan, but it's, it works the same way. Um, then you've got um, your own self-employment tax, independent, you know, um, independent tax. I don't know. I'd have to look, but when I started, it was it was 13 percent more than what you guys pay at a regular job. So what I was what I was being federally taxed and state taxed in my day job, as soon as I went independent, they added 13 more percent. Yep. So you have to make 13 percent more to live the same lifestyle. So it's part of it. That's just the way tax is. So you have to budget an extra 13 cents every dollar. Right. So um, to this day, we live on about 65, 70 percent of what 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 it comes into the house and the yeah. rest of it is. Um, investments, taxes, taxes, investments, and retirement. Hmm. All the stuff. It is, stuff. it is not fun. And, uh, you know, I'm sure. You might retire uh, one day. <laughs> I'm sure the UK and I'm sure Canada has different options for all this kind of stuff. But for, in general, it's all pretty much the same. You know, just try to be organized, become an expert, build your network. Engage. I'm going to write up something, just to let everybody know, I'm going to try to scout. I know this is drink and draw. We haven't drawn a thing today, <laughs> um, but I'm going to. We've uh, drawn gonna, on your experiences is what we've done. Uh, yes. <laughs> 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 nice, eh? <laughs> and, and then one last dad joke. Craig's tossed in. Freelance equals retirement, right? Uh, he did throw in the winky, <laughs> the winky face emoji. So, yeah, so we can all have a good chuckle about that. Kevin, as always... Oh, there's the trombone. Kevin, as always, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome. Um, and and when, when you've got what, uh, you know, your sort of summary notes or whatever that uh, you're going to do, we'll, we'll include those as part of the blog post. Um, folks, don't forget, we've got the LinkedIn group that, um, that you can join us in. Uh, Brent, have you got that handy? 
There it is. There we go. The LinkedIn group, join us there. Um, lots of stuff that we share and post uh, in there. Also, headlight, uh, headlights? No, headlining, updating, you know, future things. We got more shows coming. Do things like sign up for those. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> Save your spot. Let's dance out of here. All right. Thanks, gang.